The title of my talk is Four on the Floor, and my faculty discussion is Dr. DeBoven. I have no financial disclosures, and my case starts with a 30-year-old male who presents complaining of decreased vision for the past few years, and he says his glasses no longer help. No other ocular history, no family history, his prior medical history and medications are withheld for, for now for sake of his talk. He has no allergies and his, uh, we'll get into his exam. So his vision is 20-25 in both eyes with correction. Pupils are normal, his IOP is borderline, the remaining exam is unremarkable. This was his current glasses prescription and that was his auto refraction on presentation. A little more myopic than what he's actually wearing. His anterior exam was otherwise unremarkable. And here I have fundus photos. Would a resident like to describe these for us? How about Dr. Scott? He's a 30-year-old. The fundus photos of the right and left eye. Um, it's clear in. It's kind of a Probably just poor quality photo. I can't see much of the periphery, but the nerves look okay. The macula uh, shows small, fine, scattered exudates, most concentrated in the temporal regions of both fundus, and then sort of there's blunting of the foveal reflex with a ring of maybe some yellow exudates as well. Yeah, that's good. And the uh, vessels are normal as well. Here's an autofluorescence. It's a little hazy view in the right. Um, otherwise, an unremarkable autofluorescence. And on infrared images, you, you can see some hyperreflectivity in the area of those deposits. And could you describe the OCT for us? So uh, OCT, the right and left eye. And, uh, both eyes are fairly symmetric in terms of a slightly abnormal foveal contour and some temporal thinning in both sides. Excellent. And we got swept source OCT angiography on this patient in the right and left eye. In the B scan on the left side of the picture, uh, there's you can see the temporal thinning there as well. And this is segmentation at the superficial retina. You can see the vessels look fairly normal in both eyes. The structure photos, you can see um, some hyperreflectivity in the temporal area where those deposits are. And then, of course, on the thickness map, you see temporal thinning of the fovea and macula. So could you entertain a differential for this patient? Yeah, so um, we have decreased vision and bilaterally in a 30-year-old male. Um, Fundus photos are most significant for, I guess, some exudates mostly concentrated in the posterior pole and the macula temporally each side. This could be something like a MACTEL is kind of what I'm thinking of. Um, those fine exudates could be uh, like a... If you were calling them deposits, so I'm thinking crystalline-like deposits uh, that can happen with different types of medications uh, like talc or tamoxifen, nitrofurin, um, Other types of uh, dystrophies uh, include like cystinosis, uh, alport, uh, can cause small exudates, exudates in the posterior pole. It's uh, pretty much all I got. Yeah, that's pretty good. You hit a lot of the big ones. Um, and there's some other ones that we don't see very often, of course. And so, like you said, the crystalline differential kind of gives you a certain differential like this with some drug-induced causes. There are some ocular diseases that give you some crystals and flecks throughout the, fo uh, throughout the posterior pole like that and some systemic diseases like outports and primary hypo hyperoxaluria. So that brings me to the objectives of this talk, which is to briefly compare the differential diagnosis and, and clinical findings in, of crystals and flecks in the retina. So we're going to go through these uh, briefly, starting with the drug-induced toxicities. Tamoxifen, like you mentioned, it's a selective estrogen receptor modulator. It's used to treat metastatic breast cancer uh, in hormone receptor positive patients. These patients get parafoveal intraretinal refractile opacities and cystoid macular edema that can mimic MACTEL, like you said. In a paper published through Baskin Palmer with Dr. Fortune and Debovi and Doshi, they uh, postulized that this, in the similarity to macular telangiectasia type 2, is a pathogenesis associated with Mueller cells. And they recommended a baseline uh, fundus exam and OCT for patients who are getting started on tamoxifen retinopathy. These patients do get CME that leaks on fluorescein angiogram, and when stopping this medication, the CME usually resolves. However, the crystals often remain in perpetuity. 
Canthazanthine. This is a carotenoid food coloring agent that has been used in uh, pill form as a sun tanning agent. It darkens the skin. These patients, when they take it for a long time, can get yellow dots surrounding the macula in an ovoid pattern. It's often denser inferiorly and in the papillomacular bundle. These patients are asymptomatic and the crystals usually resolve with cessation of the, uh, of the agent. Talc emboli, which is another one you mentioned. Talc emboli retinopathy. Talcum powder is a fine powder that has a lot of uses in our society. Historically, it was common in baby powder. Uh, it's also has been used in the illegal drug industry to mix with cocaine and heroin and drugs like that, which actually increases the volume of the drug and thus increases the street value. When patients use it intravenously, they can get emboli to small vessels, and you can see it here in the vasculature of the retina. Of course, this can cause ischemic problems with neovascularization and proliferative retinopathy. Nitrofurantoin, another one you mentioned, is uh, antibi uh, antibiotic used to treat UTIs and bladder infections. And when taken long term, this can cause crystal deposits in the retina that look identical to cantazanthin. This patient had been on it for 19 years daily. Secondary oxalosis, there's a primary form and a secondary form of oxalosis. Primary is an inborn error of metabolism. Secondary is due to excess intake or uh, decreased excretion. Methoxyfluorine is an anesthetic that was used in the past and would cause crystalline deposition in the retina. West African crystalline maculopathy. So this was originally reported in 2003 by Dr. Seraf. Described six elderly patients from the Igbo tribe in southwest Nigeria. The etiology is unknown, but they postulate it's from colonut injection or uh, ingestion or from retinal vascular diseases. A lot of these patients also had diabetic retinopathy. Here you see a uh, bilateral asymmetric cluster of refractile crystals in the fovea, and you can see them there on OCT as well. So to thicken the plot a little bit, these are the drug-induced uh, toxicities, and here are the drugs that our patient was on. We don't see any of those drugs on this list, but he is on tacrolimus, mycophenolate, prednisone, aspirin, and some multivitamins. And we can mark all of those off the list. So we'll move on to the ocular causes of crystals in the retina, starting with Bietti's crystalline corneoretinal dystrophy. This is a rare autosomal disorder caused by mutation in the CYP4V2 gene. It's more common in East Asia, specifically China and Japan. These people get yellow crystals in the posterior pole. It can also be deposited on the limbus and the conjunctiva. They also get RPE abnormalities. Fundus albipunctatus. This is a form of congenital stationary night blindness due to a defect in the RDH5 gene. This encodes 11 cis retinol dehydrogenase, which is involved in rhodopsin metabolism. These patients are night blind from birth, and they get these small yellow white deposits in the posterior pole and mid-periphery that spare the fovea. Stargardt's disease. This is the most common hereditary macular dystrophy. It's usually autosomal recessive. It's due to a mutation in the ABCA4 gene, which is a very large gene. And there are hundreds of mutations uh, of this gene that are associated with Stargardt's, which causes uh, a, a wide variability in presentation and severity of the disease. It's a juvenile onset bilateral foveal atrophy, and they get surrounding discrete yellowish or pisiform flecks at the RPE. And these patients, when you do a fluorescein angiogram, have a pathognomonic dark choroid on the early FA. And autofluorescence is also helpful in diagnosing these patients. Retinitis punctata albescens. This is a progressive rod cone dystrophy. It's a subtype of retinitis pigmentosa. They get small white dots scattered throughout the fundus, and they can also have other features of retinitis pigmentosa, like arterial attenuation and pigment deposition in the periphery. These patients are also uh, have nyctalopia in childhood, and ERG can be helpful in differentiating this. So looking at the ocular, ocular diseases, and we'll thicken the plot just a little bit more, our patient didn't have any night blindness, no corneal findings, and his RPE was uh, grossly normal on OCT, so we'll mark all those off the list. So now we'll move to the systemic diseases. Starting with primary hyperoxaluria, this is the primary form, which is a rare inborn error of glyoxalate metabolism. It's inherited in autosomal recessive. And excess oxalate builds up in tissues throughout the body, including the eye and the kidneys. These patients get a kidney failure in early adulthood, and 30% of them have crystals in the retina. And you can see here on OCT, they get crystals in the RPE and the outer retina and several layers.
these patients lose vision from optic atrophy and not from the retinopathy. Cystinosis is a lysosomal storage disease. And these patients have excess cysteine in the lysosomes. There's three types, but only one type has retinopathy. And these patients also have renal failure, growth delay, and rickets uh, early in life. Sjogren Larsen syndrome is a rare autosomal recessive disease that causes ichthyosis in the skin, mental retardation, and a symmetric spastic paresis of the extremities. These patients also get yellowish pigment changes in the macula with crystal deposition. Alport syndrome is an X-linked disorder that affects the eyes, ears, and kidneys. These patients have several eye findings, including lenticonus, keratoconus, posterior polymorphous dystrophy, cataracts, and a dot and fleck retinopathy. Um, with multiple small yellow-white dots that surround the fovea. These patients can also get macular holes occasionally. So now we'll give you the full picture. Our patient had bilateral sensory, neuro, sensory neural hearing loss, and he did have a kidney transplant when he was 16 years old, and he didn't have any skin changes, growth delay, rickets, or kidney stones. So in summary, when we saw this patient, we went back to do a really good exam of the lens, and he did have some changes uh, that are represented in this photo, which is not our patient. We were unable to get photos of him. And adding, adding this with a dot and fleck retinopathy and his refraction, this and this now anterior lenticonus, um, we had figured out that this patient had Alport syndrome. We actually knew it because he told us. But this, so we can mark all this stuff off the list. Which brings me to the title of my presentation: Four on the Floor. This is a music term that describes a rhythm that was made popular in the 70s where in a 4-4 time the bass drum is hit on every beat and you could hear this in just about every disco song in the 70s on the radio. Four on the floor is also a term used, to, uh, a, memory, a memory term used to remember that type 4 collagen is found in basement membranes which is the defect in Alport syndrome. So Alport syndrome is was first described by Dr. Alport in 1927. He originally called it hereditary nephritis, but it was renamed Alport syndrome uh, because there are many causes of nephritary heritis, uh, nef hereditary nephritis. Most common form is X-linked in about 85% of patients. There's also autosomal recessive and autosomal dominant forms. This is due to a defect in type 4 collagen, which is the major collagen in basement membranes, and it's associated with defects in the COL4A5 gene in the X-linked form, which is on the X chromosome. It affects approximately 1 in 50,000 newborns, which equates to about 3% of newborns with end-stage renal disease. And they also get renal, ocular, and ear findings and hypertension. In the kidney, they most often present with a microscopic hematuria, proteinuria, and in the second or third decade of life, their kidneys fail and they require a kidney transplant like our patient. On electron microscopy of the glomerular basement membranes, you can see abnormal and thickening of the basement membrane in the kidneys. In the ear, it affects the basement membrane of the cochlea, and these pa patients get hearing loss. Early on, it's the higher frequencies, and it uh, progresses to lower frequencies later. And coincidentally, the hearing loss stabilizes with the onset of end-stage renal disease. Hearing aids are very helpful in these patients. These patients also have multiple eye findings, including anterior lenticonus, which has been pathognomonic, cataracts, recurrent corneal erosions, posterior polymorphous corneal dystrophy, the dot and fleck retinopathy, and occasionally uh, macular holes. The dot and fleck retinopathy does not affect vision. The dots and flecks are present in the internal limiting membrane, NFL, and the superficial retina. And as we've seen in the OCTs, these patients have temporal thinning of the macula, which is due to the thinning of the ILM and the inner retinal layers. In some of these papers, they uh, notice that the thinning of the retina is actually more common than anterior lenticonus, and it's actually more common than the dot and fleck retinopathy. It was present in 89% of men with X-linked Alport syndrome. In our patient, I did swept source OCT angiography with very thin, thin segmentation at the anterior surface of the retina, and you can see all the dots and flecks there in the structure photo. On pathology, the ILM, NFL, NFL and INL are thinned, and diagnosis, of course, is through history taking when looking at these crystalline retinopathies. And diagnosis of Alpine syndrome is used as, uh, in conjunction with primary care doctors and nephrologists. 
Management is usually for the symptomatic corneal and lenticular disease. And of course, kidney transplants and hearing aids are, do well, and these patients have a good prognosis with the kidney transplants.